I'm Dr. Christine Cooper and I'm a senior lecturer here at Curtin University in Perth in Western Australia. Um, my research interests are in comparative animal physiology. So I'm really interested in how animals meet their energy requirements, uh, meet their water requirements and maintain their body temperature regulation. And I work mostly on birds and mammals, but also a little bit on reptiles and amphibians as well. So monotremes are a really ancient group of mammals that branched off from the other mammals, which we call therian mammals, which are the placental and the marsupial mammals, really early on. And monotremes uh, consist of echidnas, and there's the short-beaked echidna that we have here in Australia, and there's also a couple of species of long-beaked echidna that live in New Guinea, and the platypus. And monotremes are really special because they're mammals, but they lay eggs. So instead of giving birth to live young, they, they lay an egg, which then hatches and then they carry that young in their pouch for a little while and then they put it in a burrow. So echidnas are relatively large. They can weigh three to five kilos in general and they're covered in sharp spines and those spines are modified hairs and they use those for defence. So they eat invertebrates, mostly ants and termites, and to access those, they have a really long snout and a really long sticky tongue, and they lick up their ants and termites uh, that they feed on. They don't have any teeth, and they just use their tongue to eat ants and termites, and they wander around and they use their spines to protect them from predators. Yeah, so one of the really interesting things about echidnas is they're supposed to be very intolerant to heat. So they have very low tolerance to getting hot. But echidnas live all over the Australian continent, including in the deserts where it gets really hot. So we've suspected for a long time that they can tolerate heat a lot better than what we've previously thought. So we went out with a thermal camera and we were able to take thermal video of our echidnas. And we found the tip of their nose is really cold. And the tip of their nose has a big blood sign. So it has a big, almost like a balloon of blood sitting in the tip of their nose. And what they do is they blow bubbles from their nose, which burst over the tip of their snout. And this cools the skin above the blood sinus and lets them dissipate heat or lose heat uh, through the tip of their nose. We observe them out and about behaving naturally at temperatures a couple of degrees higher than what's previously been considered to be lethal for echidnas. So they can clearly tolerate these temperatures and were actually active and foraging quite normally and looking pretty happy and able to cope with those higher temperatures. So the first thing is that echidnas are more tolerant to heat. So maybe they're not as primitive and as bad at thermoregulation as we've previously assumed. They're obviously better at dealing with hot conditions. It's a positive news story for climate change. So in areas that are going to get hotter, they can um, do better than we would have predicted. Um, so that's really good. And it's a really nice example of how we can use modern technology to study animals in the field. So by able, being able to thermally image our echidnas, we were able Able to measure their surface temperature remotely so we didn't have to disturb them. We could watch them when they were going about their business, acting and behaving naturally and still be able to get thermal data from them. Yes, so there's two uh, issues with fire. The first is surviving the actual fire itself, but the second is surviving the aftermath of the fire. So when the bushland has all been burnt and there's no food available, well, how do the animals survive that? So the echidnas uh, tend to shelter in burrows or logs and surviving the initial fire can be a bit problematic. So we were able to study echidnas that were in place during a prescribed burn and some of the animals were able to survive that fire. They either left the area or sheltered somewhere that didn't burn, but some of the animals did die in the original fire. So they were in a log. We actually had two animals in the same log. One left the log and survived. One stayed in the log and died in place. However, once the fire had passed, the animals that survived then had to survive in that environment afterwards. And we found that they used torpor. So what they did is they dropped their body temperature down and they became inactive for long periods of time. And that reduced their requirements for energy and water and meant that they could survive in a post-fire landscape where if they remained active, they would have um, made it, it would have made it more challenging for them to find food and water after the fire. The 
I'm fortunate enough to do both laboratory work and field work. And like most biologists, it's the field work that we really enjoy. Um, so because I like to study animals and how they behave in their natural environment, I work in lots of different field environments. The area we did the echidna study is a place called Dryandra Woodland, which is open uh, eucalypt woodland. Uh, it's about 200 kilometres from where I live in Perth, and it's very easily accessible. So we go out there and to find the echidnas, there's a whole lot of dirt tracks in the woodland and we just drive slowly around at about five kilometres an hour looking out for the echidnas and when we spot one, then we stop and we film it with our thermal camera. I've always been interested in animals and I can't remember a time when I ever wanted to do anything else than be a zoologist. So I enjoy being with animals, working with them, and I find them really interesting. So I decided to study biology and then zoology, and that gives me the opportunity to um, ask interesting questions about a whole lot of different animals and study them both in the laboratory and in the field.